Thank you, Elder. That, that was such a generous introduction that I can hardly wait to meet me. <laughs> I've decided that I like Missouri very much. No, I, I really do. Um, and I, you notice I got it right. I practiced all the way here. In Canada, it's pronounced Missouri, eh? <laughs> but it's Missouri. And, and it's not that... It's, well, I'll tell you why I liked it so much. On the freeway on the way here, I noticed a sign that said, this way to Boonville. I thought, how great is this state? Boonstra, Boonville. And just moments ago, on my way into the grounds, I crossed into Boone County. It's like I own half the state. I've never... A few days ago... Kelly, did you go already? I know she had to go. That was beautiful, by the way, Kelly. All those piano lessons I gave you have been paying off. And... <laughs> oh, she, I know she had to run out. A few days ago, the good folks at your conference office emailed me. What, what is your title? What are you going to speak on? And the truth was, I had no idea two days ago what I'd be speaking on. And so when you go to the ABC and look for this recording, you will find a title on there. Um, and I can't remember what it is. Part one, yeah. It's, it's part one. <laughs> If I were to give it a title, it'd be one word. It's our motto at the Voice of Prophecy. It's believe. That's it. That's our whole motto. Believe. I'm going to challenge you to believe, not, not just to believe what you believe up, up here intellectually. And it's one thing to give mental assent to a whole bunch of doctrines, but it's a completely different ball game to live it out in your daily life and to test the promises of God on an hourly basis, to walk out of your door in the morning and actually put the promises of God to the test in your daily life. That's a completely different game. Christianity is one of those few things in the world that you only ever know by doing. You can't just study it. You've got to do it. It's, it's not just a matter of how much information you can accumulate. That's not the purpose of God's church. It's not the purpose of the Scriptures. Just to inform you, it's to change your life and to have you live differently and test your faith against the promises of God. That's what it's all about. It's like bungee jumping, right? I can tell you that I believe that bungee jumping works. I believe that that elastic cord is going to stop my mass from hitting the bottom of the river just in time so that I don't hit my head on the bottom and crack my melon open. And I can pull out my pocket calculator and I can, okay, test the wind, figure it out, and I can tell you scientifically, I know for a fact that cord's going to stop me before I hit the bottom, but there's only one way I'm really going to know it. You have to put the cord on, you're going to have to jump. That's my challenge to you. We're going to read from Revelation chapter 7, then I'm going to pray, then I'll share some thoughts with you about Revelation chapter 7, and then we'll be on our way to our rest this evening. Revelation chapter 7. After this, John says, I beheld and lo, a great multitude. Now, I don't know if you've ever noticed it, but in the book of Revelation, there's kind of this unique pattern. John first hears about something, and then he turns around and he sees it. So, for an example, in Revelation chapter 1, he hears a voice like many waters, and then he turns and he sees Jesus dressed like a high priest standing among seven candlesticks. In Revelation chapter 5, which we're going to look at briefly later on this evening, in Revelation chapter 5, he hears about the lion of the tribe of Judah, and when he turns to see the lion, he sees a lamb looking as if it's been slain. In Revelation chapter 7, he hears about 144,000 and then he turns, and behold, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations, kindreds, peoples, and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. This is God fulfilling His promise to Abraham. The book of Hebrews chapter 11 says that Abraham did not live long enough to see the fulfillment of the promise made to him. And that's because nobody gets the reward, it says in Hebrews 11, until we all get it together. This is that moment where Abraham sees the promise come to pass. A crowd so big that you can't number it. Verse 11, uh, 10. No, verse, 11, yeah, verse 10. And cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, who sits upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne, and about the elders and the four beasts, and fell before the throne on their faces, and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing, and glory, and wisdom, and thanksgiving, and honor, and power, and might. It's a sevenfold uh, benediction. It is a perfect benediction. 
honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I know full well that when I step up behind this podium, I don't have a right to be here. I know who I am. I know where I've been. And I know that I'm not fit to represent your thoughts, except that you would take a coal from heaven's altar and touch my lips with it tonight. You would forgive my sin and cover me with the blood of Christ and make me fit to speak. Tonight we believe that this book is not like the other books on our shelf. It's the voice of our Almighty God and Creator. Peter wrote that we are born again by the Word of God. I'm praying that would be true again tonight, that it would change us. That we would hear the voice of Jesus, that the rest of the world would just fade away for a moment so that we could hear Him and see Him and become more like Him. Lord, I, I ask tonight that you'd blow the dust out of my soul and ignite a fire there that's unmistakably your fire. And when Jesus speaks to our hearts tonight, we covenant with you that we will follow the Lamb wherever He goes. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. About eight or nine years ago now, I got back to the office after a long trip, and there on my secretary's desk was a package from Amazon.com. There is nothing more exciting than a package from Amazon.com. It was a book. Now, my secretary used to open all of my mail for me except the boxes from Amazon.com. She knew that was sacred territory, and she was not to touch those. And so on this occasion, I got in, and the box was sitting there, and she had taken a red jiffy marker and drawn a ribbon and a bow on the box because she knew that every box from Amazon.com was like my birthday. And she said, I know the routine. You take your box, you go in your office, close your door, I'll hold all your calls for the next half hour while you look at your new book. I was so excited. I sat at my desk, I opened the box, I pulled out the book, and there I was. I had been on back order. I'd been waiting for it forever, a book on ancient Babylon. Now, not Babylon as in Nebuchadnezzar. I mean, that's the Neo-Babylonian Empire. I mean ancient Babylon, all the way back to the plains of Shinar and the five original cities. It was really old stuff, and I was so excited, I started to thumb through the book, and by the time I got down to page 67 of that book, two thoughts popped into my mind. Thought number one, where in the world was Amazon.com when I was pastoring on the Alaska Highway with a territory that took 15 hours to drive across and the only bookstore in that 15-hour radius sold nothing but Harlequin romances? And I'm not a romantic guy. Ask my wife. We've been together 25 years. I'm not a... Harlequin romances, that was thought number one. Where was Amazon back then? We didn't have Kindles. We didn't have... I know some of you that are younger in the room can't imagine a world without Kindles or Amazon, but it existed. We had to go to the library. I had to save my money all year long, drive to the city, 15 hours to go to a real bookstore. That was thought number one. Thought number two, as I thumbed through that and I got down to the Code of Hammurabi, page 67, the thought was, what in the world are you doing, Sean? You hate history. At least you did when you were in high school. And it's true, I detested history. I thought in high school, history was the most boring subject on earth. I mean, it was all about dead people. There's nothing you can do to change their lives anymore. They've been dead for centuries. You can't change their decisions. You can't influence what's going to happen to them. They're dead and buried and gone. And it seemed to me like living in the present was more important. And maybe we could influence some politicians who are still alive today. I hated history. And it did not help. Pardon me, any Canadians that might be in the room. But it did not help that I had to study Canadian history. Canadian history is the most boring history on the face. Look, Canadians are just too polite. They never do anything exciting. You can run over a Canadian and he'll apologize to you for leaving a mark on your tires. We are too polite. Nothing interesting. They put the textbook on my desk. I was 15, 16 years old, and I started to thumb through it praying, oh, please, let there be something interesting in here. And I saw it. It mentioned the greatest civil disturbance in Canadian history. Oh, this is going to be good. Do you know what the greatest civil disturbance in Canadian history was? It was the Winnipeg General Strike of 1919. Now, by show of hands in this auditorium, how many of you have ever heard of the Winnipeg 
general strike of 19... Not, oh, oh, there's one person. One person. Do you know why you've never heard about it? It's the most boring civil disturbance in the history of the world. It's awful. Let me tell you what happened. 6,000 angry Canadians gather. I mean, that's hard to picture, right? 6,000 angry Canadians. They gather in front of City Hall in Winnipeg, Manitoba, because it's 1919. And the war's just over. The economy's in tatters. Nobody has any work. And so they get agitated, and they're there to protest and agitate. And at the height of their anger, 6,000 angry Canadians push over an electric streetcar. That's it. Biggest civil disturbance in Canadian history. It got a little bit worse. I mean, it was 1919, and you'll remember what happened in October of 1917, the Bolshevik Revolution, right? The Communist Revolution. And so the Royal Canadian Mounted Police were there, and they got a little worried. When they saw the street car go over, they fired two shots into the crowd, and I guess somebody got a bullet somewhere that had to be extracted. But that was it. And I closed the book. I was disappointed. It was going to be a long year. And I looked at all the other people on earth. I thought, they have to take history too. But at least it's exciting, isn't it? I mean, the French, they gather their courage. They storm the prison at the Bastille. They set all the prisoners free. They overthrow the monarchy. They overthrow the papacy. They're chopping people's heads off. They're stabbing people in their bathtubs. At least it's interesting. Bolsheviks in Russia crushing the imperial system of the czars. The Americans are my cousins south of the 49th parallel. You're throwing all the tea in the harbor. You're doing interesting things. But Canadians push over an electric streetcar. I hated history. If I was ever, and young people, you can put your fingers in your ears for a moment, but if I was ever to be found off of school grounds during school hours... It was history class. If we had had cable television and the History Channel had been available, I would have called and canceled it. I hated it that much. I know some of the youngest people in... Really, there was a day and age when you didn't have cable? That's right. And I know now cable's passe. That seems like something for old people. There was a day when I was the remote control. (laughs) Some of you know exactly what I mean. Hated history. Now, here's what I want you to think about tonight. Here I am, 17, 16 years old, I don't remember how old I was, and I hate history. And by the time I'm 22, along comes this group of people known as the Seventh-day Adventists. And I don't know if you've paid attention to yourselves, but you are history on legs. You love history. Along come the Seventh-day Adventists, they have big charts. You eat, sleep, and breathe history. You've got charts with dates, and you have people with all these really historical-sounding names. Hiram Edson, Uriah Smith. You are history in the flesh. So here's the question I want you to contemplate, and it's a serious question. I want you to think about it, contemplate it in the weeks ahead. What are the odds that a group of people like you are going to reach a kid like me. What are the odds? If you go to the so-called church growth experts, and I've been there, they have some good things to offer, but if you go to the church growth experts, they'll tell you, forget it, you're never going to reach a kid like that. I mean, you can't go to a kid like that with a message like yours. The demographics prove it. The minute you start talking about Egypt and Israel and Babylon and Medo-Persia and Greece and Rome and the Waldensians and the Reformations, he's going to tune out halfway through your lecture, maybe get up and walk out the door. He'll never come back, that's for sure. And forget the lecture and sermon format, that's never going to work with a kid like that. They're the MTV generation. They expect to be entertained. Not going to reach him. You know something? I've read most of the studies by the church growth experts. I, I really have, and there's some good stuff in there. I don't want you to walk out with the wrong message tonight. And as I've looked at those studies, I've noticed that on the surface it looks pretty good, makes perfect sense. I mean, logically speaking, what they have to offer makes absolute sense. They've got the numbers to prove what they say. They've got the data, the charts, the cultural studies. They've got their finger on the pulse of modern culture. And they publish their results. And unfortunately, far too often, we've been listening. And we've changed the way we do everything based on what they tell us in their studies. 
And we look at the studies and say, well, look, the study says that America is getting less and less religious and we're now post-Christian, which isn't true, by the way. I've worked in post-Christian countries and America is not it. Did you realize that in 1787, when New Hampshire ratified the Constitution, not bad for a kid who hated history, right? 1787, when they ratified the Constitution, 17% of Americans attended church, 17%. You know what the number is today? 34%. It's double what it was at the founding of this nation. Now, is it in decline? Sure it is. But we are nowhere near a post-Christian nation. But we look at the studies. Studies say America is getting less and less religious, so maybe it's time to preach less and less from the Bible and maybe do something else to reach the community. We look at the studies. The studies say, well, young people aren't really interested in church anymore, so maybe it's time to make church look like it's not actually church. And we look at the studies, and the studies say, hey, secular people don't really care about Bible prophecy because they're not even sure if they believe in God. So maybe it's time to rethink this business about preaching our sermons out of books like Daniel and Revelation. We listen to it because it makes good logical sense. They've got the numbers to prove what they're saying. They really do. I've read them. Logically, it makes good sense. On the surface, it makes good sense. It appeals to my logic. Or, if I'm really honest about it, I'd have to admit that it more appeals to my fear than it does my logic. Because we look at the assignment God has given us as a Seventh-day Adventist church, and it scares the stuffing out of us. God says, hey, take this message, the three angels' messages, and go out and preach it to the world. And we look at the message, we say, we love that message. We study it and study it and study it. It makes sense. It's a cohesive system of belief. We love this message, but then we go and we open the drapes and we look at the world we're supposed to share it with, and we panic. How do I share that with those people? doesn't seem possible. So when the studies come out and the experts say, well, it can't even be done, we breathe a sigh of relief. Oh, good. I mean, we would do it if it was possible, but the studies say it isn't possible, so we're just going to have to wait for the latter rain to come, and then the Lord will finish the work in righteousness. There's just one little problem with all those studies. Well, there's more than one, but there's one key problem with all those studies. I've lined them all up on my desk. I collect them all. And some of them are good. Don't throw them all out. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. There's valuable information in there. What we're talking about tonight is whether or not you're going to choose to live by the promises of God or the studies of experts. That's the question we're going to answer tonight. I've looked at all the studies. I've laid them out on my desk. And I've looked, okay, this study says I can't preach the three angels' messages to these people, and this study says I can't preach it to those people, and this one study says I can't preach it to those people, and I'm wondering when I'm done, what do I have left? I'm left over with such a tiny sliver of humanity that it doesn't look anything like the multitudes, nations, kindreds, tongues, and people that Revelation 14 says we will be preaching this message to. And it sure doesn't look like the numberless crowd that is so big you can't count it in Revelation chapter 7. And it sure doesn't look like Revelation chapter 18 where another angel comes down from God out of heaven and shouts with a loud voice and the Bible says that before Jesus comes the whole world lights up with His glory. Doesn't look like, doesn't look at all like the promise to Abraham. Hey, Abraham, wake up. Lord, I'm having so much trouble sleeping. Why would you get me up in the middle of the night? Because I've got to show you something, Abraham. Get out of your tent. Come down to the river's edge. What is it, Lord? I'm so tired. No, no, grab a handful of sand, Abraham. How much do you have? I got a handful. No, no, how many grains? I don't know. It's a lot. That's right. Now look at the whole shore of the river. Look at the whole bank. How much sand is there? That's how many descendants you are going to have one day. Look up in the sky, Abraham. How many stars can you see? The naked eye can see about 5,000. And then sometime after your 40th birthday, it goes down to 2,500. But when you're young, you can see 5,000. He could. I don't know, Lord. How many stars? One, two, three. I can't count them all. That's right. You won't be able to count your descendants. It doesn't. The studies don't look anything like the promise of God. So, either, here's the decision I have to make, either God made a mistake with His message and the audience He told us to preach it to, or maybe there's a problem with the studies. That's the decision we're faced with. I don't want you to get the wrong idea. I'm not against academia. I love academia. If I had a choice, I'd lock myself in my office the rest of my life because books are more polite than people. Amen? I'd lock myself in there the rest of my life. It's fun in there. Love academia. I just want to ask you one question. In thousands of years of human academia, how often have we been infallible? 
I went to University of Victoria, they handed out the textbooks, and I noticed that most of them were in their 67th or 68th edition. Do you know why? Because every year they've got to change their mind. Every year they need to sell more, but every year they've got to change their mind about what was in those. I mean, let me exaggerate for effect. Did you realize that for centuries we believed as a settled scientific fact that men had more teeth than women? We believed that for centuries and centuries and centuries. Do you know why we believed that? It's because one day Aristotle is parading around on the platform in front of his students, and I don't know what he's lecturing on, but somehow a synapse fires in a different direction, and he makes a leap of logic and suddenly says in front of the room, and that's why men have more teeth than women. Students wrote, well, it's Aristotle, he's got to be right. We believed it for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. The only problem with the theory was nobody ever opened Mrs. Aristotle's mouth and counted her teeth. How long have we been infallible? Am I against academia? No. I love it. You ought to get all the education you can. Every last bit of it that you can. Never stop drinking at the fountain of knowledge. But the problem happens when we take ourselves too seriously. It's good to study. It's wrong to put more faith in your results than in the Word of God. Because the Bible speaks about this condition. Human beings can come to this place where they're ever learning and never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Never settle for sure on a fact. Never know something with any certainty. Never want to rest somewhere. Human academics have always, always, always been prone to mistakes. But not once in thousands of years now have Christians ever had to apologize for the words found in the Word of God. Now, we've had to apologize for how we've used them. We've had to apologize for how we've behaved. But we have never had to apologize for the words of the Bible. So I've got to tell you tonight in this camp of the saints that if it comes down to deciding what God asks of my life, if I have to choose between what the experts are saying is possible and what the Bible says is possible, I'll tell you which one is the safer bet. It's always been exactly the same. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the Word of the Lord stands forever. Got to make a choice. Choice is obvious. I'm going with the Bible. Any study that contradicts the promises of God in the Bible is dead wrong. How do I know? Because here I am, less than a quarter century later, ripping open a package from Amazon.com, and it's my 2,000th book on history that I'd purchased at that point, because suddenly I loved history, because it doesn't matter who wrote the history book. It could be an atheist who wrote it. They can't help themselves as they describe the unfolding of human history. They are describing the hand of God at work in this world, nudging us toward the grand and glorious return of Christ and the establishment of God's kingdom. It shows up every, every history book ends up being about. Jesus. I love history now. When the experts are trying to discount methods and trying to discount the preaching of the Bible, they're wrong when they discount the work of the Holy Spirit, the ability of God to take a heart and radically change it in a second's notice. Conversion isn't something you study. Conversion is something you experience. I hope you don't mind if I speak boldly this evening. I know you think I already have, but I'm just warming up. (laughs) But folks, we're running out of time. We, We are. I don't know if you've been paying attention. Most of the world hasn't got a clue what's going on. But as you watch what's taking place, particularly on the American landscape, you're seeing come to pass what we have always been told was going to come to pass. We're not anticipating it anymore. We're watching it. The Bishop of Rome has stood in the Congress of the United States to give direction. Come on now. We're out of time. So I'm going to be open and honest tonight. Let me, let me, let me say this. Some of the reasons people give me for not doing what they call so-called traditional evangelism drive me nuts. First of all, it drives me nuts that they call it traditional evangelism. Is it traditional? Sure it is. It's been going on for 2,000 years. It's worked the same way for 2,000 years. People preach the Word of God, people come to Christ. But the reason we throw the word traditional on it now is to kind of discount it, make it look old-fashioned. That's what old people do. We're discounting it. Then they give me the reasons it won't work, and they drive me nuts because I know they're not true. 
I know they're not true. I have watched tens of thousands of people come to Christ. I know they're not true. Sean, you don't understand. You can't reach a bunch of people who are living like postmodern secular pagans with the message of the Bible. Sounds logical, except for the fact that I was living like a postmodern secular pagan at one point in my life, and here I am. I believe in Jesus, and I have watched thousands more come to Christ in the meantime. It's not true. It's not true. It's a lie. Pastor, the studies prove that you can only reach people over 55 years of age with the traditional prophetic. That one bothers me more and more as I'm coming up on that mark. i got to tell you that one. You can only reach people over 55 with the traditional prophetic approach. Sounds good, except for the fact I was 22 when I became a Seventh-day Adventist believer, and I have literally watched tens of thousands of young people come into this movement since that day. It's not true. Pastor... The only people who will come to a traditional evangelistic meeting are the people who have never ever been to college, so we're going to have to do something different for the academic mind. Now, I might not be the sharpest knife in the drawer, I'm probably not, but I did go to college and it didn't dissuade me away from the gospel of Jesus Christ, and I have seen tens of thousands more academics come to Christ in the meantime. It's just not true. You don't have to change the story of the gospel depending on the audience. You really don't. Have you ever noticed Jesus had one-size-fits-all stories? He told a story, and the peasant farmer and the Sanhedrin both got the point. The gospel works with people because the gospel addresses the deepest needs of the human heart. It works. We've got to stop talking ourselves out of what God asked us to do. That's what we need to do. It is time, high time in this late hour, for God's people to just believe that God knew what He was doing when He gave us this assignment. Right? He did not make a mistake with the message. He did not make a mistake with the methods He told us to use. He did not make a mistake with the audience He told us to go to. For years, people said, Sean... You know, especially when I was getting started. Now they've given up on trying to change me. But when I was getting started, they said, who's your niche? Who's your niche going to be, Sean? Going to be young people, old people, white collar, blue collar. Who's your niche going to be? What's your audience? And I finally found my niche a few years after that. Do you know what my niche is? It's sinners. And I love that niche because they're everywhere. They're in Nordstrom's and they're in Walmart. They're downtown in every city. You can find, you can't go on these grounds without finding a sinner. They're absolutely everywhere. And that's who the gospel is for. I mean, listen to me tonight. Do you suppose for one minute, for one minute, that tonight God is up, listen to me carefully, God is in heaven this evening, looking down on this world, and He calls a meeting of the angels. Oh my goodness, I cannot believe it. Gabriel, get over here, get all the angels together. I did not see the postmodern secular generation coming. I don't know how that evaded me. I saw everything else, but I didn't see them coming, and I gave my remnant church the wrong message. Time for, do you believe it? I've got to tell you, there has never been an audience more hungry for what we have to offer than the one that is in your community right now. I have seen meetings, I'll prove it to you this weekend, I have seen meetings get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and people get more and more and more responsive, not overseas, but here in hometown America. It's working. Because what we have to offer is what they're looking for. They're confused and they're hurt and they don't know where to find the answer and you're sitting on it. If our churches aren't thriving, it's not because God blew it, because we did. I don't think our problem in North America is somehow we lost our passion to see people come to Jesus. I know you have that passion. I know you weep over the empty spots in your churches. I know that. I don't think we've lost a heart for people. But we've had this shift in our thinking over a number of generations now where we've started to think that somehow this work is up to us. That God said, hey, here's your assignment. Take the gospel to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Take the three angels' messages out there. I'll be back in 2,000 years and see how you did. Well, how do we do it, Lord? I don't know. You'll think of something over those 2,000 years, and I'll come back. We thought it's up to us. And because of that, we've been trying to dream up a way to make it happen, ignoring some really plain counsel from God, by the way. But we're trying to dream up a way to make it happen, and we've been doing some really silly things. New York Times, October 7, 2007. It's one of my favorite newspaper stories. The headline, Thou shalt not kill, except in a popular video game at church. Now, I had to read that one. First, the percussive sounds of sniper fire and the thrill of the kill. Here's the situation. They couldn't get young guys to come to church, and that's a tough demographic. I'll admit that right up front. Men are stubborn. There's a reason we die younger than the ladies. It's because we're stubborn. 
Couldn't get young guys, so they thought, we're going to buy Xboxes, and we'll buy Halo. It's a first-person shooter game, and we'll invite them to play Xbox. Church filled up with young people. Not one baptism. Why? Because bait and switch doesn't work, folks. It doesn't work. Here's how the article ended. Listen to this. This is the New York Times. No friend of Christianity, but they're scratching their head watching Christians. The question arises, what price to appear relevant? How far are these people willing to go to seem cool? That's a good question. What price to appear relevant? I was driving across Missouri some years ago, listening to the radio, and suddenly I heard a mention of the Church of God Chicken Grill. Oh, that got my attention. I want to turn that up. I turned up the Church of God Chicken Grill. I listened to the story. Here's what happened. This church couldn't get guys to come to church. It's always the guys who don't want to come to church. And so they decided, here's what we're going to do. We're going to get a barbecue chef... And after church, we're going to tailgate in the church parking lot and serve the best barbecue chicken anywhere in the county. And wouldn't you know it, it worked. They had men coming to church like crazy, hanging out for chicken barbecue. But they came in at 11.50 in the morning after the sermon was finished for the chicken. And the chicken barbecue got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And the church service got smaller and smaller and smaller until they just closed the church and opened up a restaurant. (laughs) Because bait and switch doesn't work. Let me ask you a question. What makes our message relevant to people? Somehow we've gotten the idea it's our job to make it relevant. That's not God's plan. I want you to think about this carefully tonight. I'm going to make a few points and then I'll I'll go. Here's the question. Is it our job to make people think the three angels' messages are relevant? Or is it our job to find people who do think they're relevant? Those are two different activities. Is it our job to make people think our message is relevant? Or is it our job to find the people who do think it's relevant? I want to share an interesting passage with you found in the book Desire of Ages. I think it sums up God's plan for evangelism better than anything else I've ever read. It's one paragraph. Let me see if it's ready. Is it? Are we going to be ready to go? Let me push the button and see what... Oh, we're way ahead. Let's jump back. I'm giving away all my points. All right, back it up. Back. This... Is it me? Am I in charge? I'm in charge. Oh, it's running away on me, though. All right. Listen to this paragraph. We're going to pull five points out of it, then I'm going to be quiet. I promise. The apostles were members of the family of Jesus. Actually, it's not one of my key points, but that needs to be true. If you're going to lead people to Christ, you better better know Him and be part of the family yourself. And they had accompanied Him as He traveled on foot through Galilee. They had shared with Him the toils and hardships that overtook them. They had listened to His discourses. They had walked and talked with the Son of God, and from His daily instruction, they had learned how to work for the elevation of humanity. Again, it's not the key point we're going to draw out, but pay attention. You need a daily relationship with Christ if you want to see your church grow. It continues. Here it comes. As Jesus ministered to the vast multitudes. Who ministered to the vast multitudes? It's important. The vast multitudes that gathered about Him, His disciples were in attendance, eager to do His bidding and to lighten His labor. They assisted in arranging the people, bringing the afflicted ones to the Savior and promoting the comfort of all. They watched for interested hearers explain the Scriptures to them and in various ways work for their spiritual benefit. They taught what they had learned of Jesus and were every day obtaining a rich experience. There it is. The whole plan, the way it was designed in one paragraph. Let's review five points from it and then we'll unpack it biblically and then I'll be done. Yeah, don't, don't turn it off yet. Here come the five points. Point number one, it was Jesus who ministered to the multitudes. Point number two, the disciples spent their time watching for interested hearers. Point number three, they explained the scriptures to those interested hearers. Point number four, they told what they personally knew of Jesus. And number five, they obtained a rich experience. Let's take a look at those five points. I want to show you the big picture of evangelism now as it's found in the pages of the Bible. Point number one. It's Jesus who ministers to the multitudes. It's not us. It's not really you at all. 
The message isn't ours, it belongs to Jesus. The work isn't ours, it belongs to Jesus. There's this story in the book of Revelation in chapter 5. It's one of my favorites. Although, my favorite part of the Bible is whatever part I happen to be reading that day. But Revelation 4 and 5 are a special favorite for me. I love it. John whisked into the throne room of God. And you know the story. John sees God sitting on the throne, a scroll in his hand, written on the front and back, sealed with seven seals, and a voice cries out, Who is worthy to take the scroll and open the seals thereof? And it can't find anybody. Nobody worthy. And John weeps because he knows that's important. See, Revelation 6 comes after Revelation 5. And I know that seems obvious, but hear me carefully. In Revelation chapter 6, those seals do get opened. And church history begins to unfold. The white horse rides the early apostolic church. The red horse rides the persecuted church under the pagan Roman Empire. The black horse rides a period of compromise with Constantine. A pale horse rides a period of the Dark Ages. The soul's under the altar. We come up through the period of the Reformation. It goes all the way down to the earthquake, the dark day, and the falling of the stars and the second coming of Jesus. Revelation 6, as those seals are open, is the unfolding of church history from beginning to end. It's the whole story. But unless somebody can open that scroll, it never starts. And they can't find anybody. And then he hears a voice, weep not, for the lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed. He turns to see the lion, and it's a lamb looking like he's been slain. Now, where in the Bible do you find slain lambs? It's sanctuary imagery. That's what it is. Now, there's room to disagree. But I believe with all my heart that Revelation chapter 5 shows us the installation of Jesus as heaven's high priest in heaven's sanctuary. Nothing can happen until he's installed. The church can't get started. Nothing can happen. Now, if you pay attention, notice what Jesus said to his disciples in the book of Acts. He said, you're going to go from here to Judea and Samaria to the uttermost parts of the earth, but not quite yet. You wait right here in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes. Now, here's a question for you tonight. Something to ponder. Who received the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost? Well, disciples received. They did, but that's not really what happened. As everybody's examining what's taking place on the day of Pentecost, Peter suddenly explains what's happening in Acts 2 and verse 33. He says, look, Jesus has just been exalted to the right hand of God in heaven, and He has just received the gift of the Holy Spirit and shed it forth on the church below. We didn't receive the Holy Spirit. Jesus did, and He shared it with His church below. Listen to this, Psalm 133 describes the anointing of the high priest. Behold how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. That's the day of Pentecost, amen? It is like the precious oil upon the head. What's oil? Holy Spirit. Running down the beard, the beard of Aaron. Who's Aaron? The high priest running down on the edge of his garments. Let's picture the oil being poured over the high priest running completely down and off the hem of his garment. It's what happens on the day of Pentecost. Jesus is installed as heaven's high priest. You know what that tells me? The church can't do a thing unless he's running it from heaven's sanctuary. None of this is up to us. None of it. We don't do any of it. Look at the Bible. God does the whole thing. The Bible teaches in Romans chapter 2, God gives people the gift of repentance. You can't make people repentant. Jesus said, no man can come to me except the Father who sent me draws him. John 6 verse 44. The Holy Spirit, John chapter 16, he's the one who brings people under conviction. You can't create conviction. God does it all. He picks the message, he picks the method, he picks the audience. It's all his work. None of it is up to us and you won't find a command anywhere in the Bible to tamper with it. Point number one, Jesus is the minister, not us. Point number two and three, we'll take those together in the interest of time that I'm not still speaking at 2 in the morning. Point number two. The disciples watch for interested hearers and then they explain the Scriptures to them. I want you to notice what it didn't say. They're not trying to make people interested. Because you can't. It's not possible. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, The natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. If somebody has no interest in spiritual things, there's not a thing you can do to make them interested. So you've got to ask yourself, why have we focused so much on trying to make uninterested people interested and ignored all the people who are interested in the meantime? 
Well, there are no interested people. Yes, there are. They're falling off the trees all around us because we've had the wrong focus. I can tell you they're falling off the trees all around us. We can't make people interested. God handles that part from heaven's sanctuary. What the disciples spent their time doing was studying faces to look for the interested people. And when they found those people, they opened the Bible and explained it to them. Do you know what they're doing? They're helping those people connect the dots. As those people heard the words of the Bible, they said, the voice in that book is the same voice that's been speaking to me my whole life. Some of you remember that moment. You recognize the voice in the Bible. You might not have been able to define it. You might not have been able to explain it. But that book seemed familiar to you when you heard it because God had been laboring with you your whole life before you ever met another believer. He gets to people first. He always does. God converts people. We're just there to help them connect the dots. We're there for the ride. We're there for an education. I'll talk about that in a minute. You know, when I finally got that, that we don't convert people, but we're looking for people that God is converting, my whole life changed. I watched evangelistic results go up five and tenfold overnight because we were focused on hunting for people who were interested, those who are ripe right now. If you ever get a chance, go to Gospel Workers, read that vision, Gathering the Fruit. She says, never touch the green berries. Only pick the ripe ones. The green ones, you're going to kill them if you try and pull them off the bush too fast. I realized I don't have to make people interested. What a relief. I just have to appeal to people who are interested. That's different. I used to lay awake at night. Ooh, I'm going to have an altar call tomorrow. Terrified me. I mean, public speaking terrifies me. It has, it's been 25 years, and I still get sick to my stomach thinking I've got to get up front. Altar call really scared me. What if I stand up front, and I ask people to come, and I plead with them for 25 minutes? Is there just one in here? Just one. I know you, sister. <laughs> Is there one? What if I'm not convincing enough? And then I realized I don't have to be convincing enough. God is convincing enough. I need to appeal to people to act on the conviction that God is creating in their hearts. It's completely different. Read the book of Acts carefully. I want you to notice something. Go read the whole thing. There is no such thing as a cold interest anywhere in the book of Acts. You won't find it. You won't find it. Right? The disciples never had to start from scratch. Acts chapter 2. Peter baptizes 3,000. Who are they? The Bible explains who they are. Devout men from every nation under heaven. Already interested in spiritual things. Acts chapter 8. Philip meets the Ethiopian eunuch. Right? But how does that happen? God has to come to Philip saying, Philip, you are so late for your Bible study. I have a guy in a chariot. He's halfway through the book of Isaiah. He's almost into the kingdom and you are so late. Get down there now. God gets there first. Acts chapter 9, Ananias, I've got a Bible study for you. A Bible, I love Bible studies, Lord. Who do you have in mind? Saul of Tarsus. Saul of Tarsus! I can't give a Bible study to Saul of Tarsus. He rounds up Christians to be put to death. Don't worry about it, Ananias. I already knocked him down on the ground. He's been blind and in the dark for three days. He's ready for the Bible study. <laughs> Acts chapter 10, first Gentile convert. Cornelius, who is he? The Bible says he's a devout man, already giving gifts to the temple. God creates conviction, and we go find them. It's different. No such thing as a cold interest. They're everywhere, by the way. We just haven't been studying it the right way. We haven't been watching for the interested. If you study the faces and listen to them, if we were to spend more time listening than talking, you would find them. They're everywhere. They're in the grocery store. Some years ago, Gene sent me to the grocery store on Friday. It's not very often that I'm home on a Friday. And when I'm home, it's my job to go to the grocery store. But I am not allowed to buy whatever I want. Mm -mm. <laughs> I have my cell phone with me. I'm going up and down the aisles because she knows what I'm going to do. I'm Dutch and Avenist. That's as cheap as people get. It doesn't get any cheaper than a Dutch Avenist. And I'm going to second guess everything she's ever bought. Two-ply toilet paper seems luxurious. Let's get the one-ply. And I'll change everything, so I'm not allowed. And I got my cell phone up to my head, and I'm going up, and get the peanut butter, get the right one, and, and up and down. And as I'm going up and down the aisle, suddenly the woman behind the deli counter, she can't see my phone. She thinks I'm talking to her. And so I said, oh, honey, i got to go. So I hung up. I, I went over. I said, hey, I'm so sorry. That's so rude. I hate it when that happens to me. She said, no, no problem. She said, but now that I have your attention, we have whole roasted chickens on sale, $5 each. Don't they look great? I said, they look delicious. Don't they smell good? I said, I smelled them when I walked in. They smell delicious. She said, how many do you want? I said, none. She says, why? I'm a vegetarian. You're not a vegetarian. You're just trying to get out of buying chicken. No, no, it's true. I'm a vegetarian. I'm a... <laughs> I don't want any chicken. She says, really? Why would you be a vegetarian? I said, I just found out it was better for me. Sometimes it's better not to preach and just tell you. It's better. I found out it's better for me. 
That's fascinating. So you became a vegetarian later in life? She said, I said, yeah. She says, well, I grew up a vegetarian, and now I eat chicken. <laughs> I said, well, that's fascinating. She says, no, you don't understand. We were really, really vegetarian. I'm thinking, what does really, really vegetarian? Although I've met some people that are really, really vegetarian. And she says, I'm really, really vegetarian. I said, that's fascinating. She says, no, let me explain how vegetarian we were. Every weekend, my mother made a special K roast. Exactly. <laughs> Alarm bells are going off in my head. A flag goes up the flagpole. I'm not all that smart, but I caught that one because there is no other group of people on this planet that would ever eat special K roast. <laughs> uh, I'm going to change the language just a little bit. I said, yeah, that's fascinating. I said, I, I'm going to drop the word vegetarian. I said, that's fascinating. You grew up Adventist and I didn't. She goes, yeah, oop, she said. I said, I knew it, I knew it. And I'm a Seventh-day Adventist minister. You've been busted. God sent me to the store today because I bet you haven't been to church in years. <laughs> and she hung her head. And she started to cry. She said, I was thinking about that this morning. And I didn't know how to come back, and I asked, I prayed for the first time this morning in years, asking God to make a way for me to come back. Don't. Stop paying attention to people. You get there long after God makes them ready. You are the last person to a Bible study every single time. Point two, disciples watch for people who exhibit interest. Point three, they explain the Scriptures to them. It's that simple. You don't have anything better to offer people than the Scriptures. You really don't. The voice that brought conviction to them is the same voice in that book. It's your best method. It's such an inviolable principle that even on the road to Emmaus, when Jesus appears to two disappointed disciples, and they really kind of almost are postmoderns, aren't they? They thought they knew what to believe, and now they don't know anything anymore, and they're kind of shuffling through the dirt. And even though Jesus is there in the resurrected flesh himself, and he could have just said, here I am, don't worry. He chose to give them a Bible study. The Son of God in the resurrected flesh gave a Bible. Beginning at Moses and the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. If it's good enough for Jesus, that works for me. Settles it forever. God needs you to find those who are under conviction and help them connect the dots. Point number four. The disciples told people what they personally know about Jesus. Now here's really why you're there. You're not there to convert people. God does that. There's nothing more powerful than your testimony. First they sense God's voice in their heart. Then they see God's voice in the Scriptures. And then they look at you. Why? They want to know if it's true. That's why you're sitting there. An in-the-flesh example of what God can do. There's a story in Daniel chapter 6. I love it. Darius the Mede, we don't really know who Darius was, might have been a general under Cyrus who got put in charge of battle, we don't really know, but I do know this, he was an insomniac, he couldn't sleep in Daniel chapter 6, and I love the story because I have never slept through the night in my entire life that I remember. And he's up and he's pacing the floor in the middle of the night, he won't let his whole kingdom know that, just like your neighbor will never let on that they're under conviction and they're wrestling with stuff. But some of your neighbors are pacing the floor at night because their problems are overwhelming. What is Darius's problem? Darius has made a deal that ends in death and it's irreversible. Law of the Medes and the... It's exactly what we did as a human race. Made a deal with the devil in Eden, ends in death, and we're powerless to change it. The Bible says that early in the morning he goes down to the tomb. Sean, it's a lion's den. No, it's a tomb. It prefigures Jesus because they roll a stone over the door and they seal it. And early in the morning, the one who should have been dead is alive. And they roll the stone back and Darius calls in, Daniel, are you okay? No. It's not what he says at all. Daniel, the God whom you serve continually, has he been able to save you? Why? Because if he can do something for you, Maybe he can do something for me. That's why God sends you in. People can argue everything. They can argue the cross. They can argue salvation. They can argue the Sabbath. They can argue the state of the dead. But here's what they can't argue when I'm sitting in their living room. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. 
And they'll say to me, but Sean, you're still rotten. I know. But by the grace of God, I'm less rotten today than I was yesterday. And by God's grace tomorrow, I'll be a little less rotten yet. Because God can change me and He can change you. They told them what they knew personally of Jesus. Point number five, they obtained a rich experience. Here's the whole reason, really, that we're involved. God doesn't need us to finish the work. He sent angels. He's spoken through donkeys. He doesn't need us. But we're there to learn something. We broke faith with God in Eden and stopped trusting Him. And so what does God do? He says, I got just the thing to teach you to trust me. I'm going to have you teach this message to those people. Seems completely impossible, but you will start to believe me when you see that it works. You'll start to believe me when you see the work come to pass. In Joshua chapter 1, Joshua sits outside the camp. He's just taken over as the leader. He spends a lot of time by himself thinking because, I mean, who wants to follow Moses as the next leader? You don't want to follow a spectacular success. You want to follow a, a miserable loss. I'm going to have to follow Moses. And he's sitting outside and God comes to him and presents him the whole plan. Joshua, it's time to go in. That last generation died in the wilderness. Hebrews 3.19, they could not enter in because of unbelief. But now it's time to go in. I'm going to reopen the school of faith. They reinstitute circumcision. They reinstitute the Passover. Those are both symbols of faith. And they hadn't practiced faith in 40 years, so why practice the symbols of faith? He says, I want you to reinstitute those. I am reopening the school of faith. You're going to learn to trust me. Go tell them we're going in. So Joshua goes back. Hey, we're going into the promised land. Oh, that's so great, Joshua. We don't want to die out here in the wilderness like Grandma and Grandpa did. We're ready to go in. Joshua has to present the whole plan to them, and they're going to have to take his word for it. There's just Joshua and Caleb left. Kind of reminds me of another generation of believers in the very last times where the first generation is, is gone, but there was someone in that generation who said, the Lord has shown me. We're going to have to test those promises to see if they're so. Time to go in. That's great. What are we going to do? we got to get over the Jordan River. It's flood season. It's deep. We better start building a bridge. We don't need a bridge. What do you mean no bridge? We're going to go through the river following the ark. Joshua, that's the worst plan we have ever heard in our entire lives. It's flood season. That water is six feet deep this time of year. We've been in slavery for generations. None of us is taller than five foot ten. We're going to drown in a river. That's what we're going to do. We're going to follow the ark. That's the throne in the sanctuary. You don't come up with your own plan. You follow the one Jesus gave you. They stepped into the river. The water's part. They came. It worked. It doesn't work till you step in. Oh, we are on the other side. Now what? We better start picking off some of these little rinky-dink cities and get all practiced up for war. No, we're not going after the little rinky-dink cities. We're going after Jericho. Jericho! Have you seen those people? That is one tough city with big walls. We better get started. We need spears. We need swords. We need shields. We need earthen works. We're gonna... No, we don't need any of that. What do you mean? We're going to follow the ark. Up to the city? No, around the city. That doesn't make sense, Joshua. They're going to stand on the wall and pick us off one by one. That doesn't work at all. That doesn't make a bit of logical sense. Every study proves that doesn't work. You think that's tough. We're going to do it for seven days. And they followed the ark. And I want you to notice that when the walls of Jericho fell, not one of them had touched it. Jesus had appeared with his sword drawn. I'll go ahead of you and I'll handle everything, but it's your job to follow. You know, when the walls of Jericho fell, there was a mighty shout like there is in 1 Thessalonians 4 when Jesus comes back. When the walls of Jericho fell, there was a trumpet blast like there is in 1 Corinthians 15 when Jesus comes back. Joshua 6 verse 19 tells us that after the walls fell, the gold, the silver, the brass, and the iron from inside the city was absorbed into God's people. Just like Daniel 2 tells me that when Jesus comes back, the, worlds, uh, the kingdoms of this world, the gold, the silver, the brass, and the iron, crumble and the dust is blown away and the stone fills the world. It's a picture of the second coming of Christ. And it tells me that until we follow the ark, until we do what God has asked us to do, we won't have the faith we need to live in the kingdom of heaven. Do you need faith to live in heaven? 
Yes, you do. Lucifer was not allowed into the counsels of God, and you won't be either. All of heaven runs on faith. So God says, take this message, preach it to those people, and you will see that I am God. We once lived in this house. It's going to sound grand, but it was a dump. It was really awful. Except for one thing, it had a spiral staircase. So we could play Gone with the Wind. And it made the house look kind of grand when you came in, ooh, nice house, until you took three more steps. People go, oh, what a dump. <laughs> and when Gene would go out, and my kids were little, oh, I wish they were little again. <laughs> when Gene would go out and my kids were little, I would let them crawl up the outside of the banister, all the way up the stairs, and there was a little patch of ledge up there, like 18 inches by 12 inches, and it was about nine feet above like a hardwood floor. And they would go up the outside of the banister and they would sit there kicking their legs. And I would stand underneath. And you know what I did? Because it's a father's job to recklessly endanger his children. <laughs> jump! And they'd jump. They'd come off so fast it was like lemmings. I almost didn't catch them. Bang, bang! And they'd run up again. Ooh, they'd go up the stairs, kick their legs, jump! And they'd jump off again. And they'd do it again and again and again until we heard Gene's car pull up into the driveway and then we stopped and played Lego. <laughs> A lot of fun. And then I remember the day Gene went out. They crawled up there. I stood underneath, jump, and they hesitated, and it hurt. Why aren't you jumping? Dad, you had that back surgery last year, and your eyesight's not what it used to be. I know it made sense, but it hurt. In the Garden of Eden, we used to jump. God would come in the cool of the evening, we'd believe everything He said. And then one day we hesitated. And it destroyed everything. How will God get us back to the point where we jump without thinking? Take this message and preach it to those people. And you will see that I am alive and I can be trusted. Father in heaven, we admit it scares us this one thing you've asked your people to do. But with our hearts beating wildly in our chests, we will exercise courage. We will believe that your promise is good and that in the end the crowd is so big it can't be counted. We don't know what to say. We don't know how to begin. But we're asking tonight that you would teach us to see people the way you see them. Listen to them and hear them the way that you hear them. Lead us to somebody this week who has been hearing you speak. And even though we don't know what to say and we don't know what to do, we covenant with you that we will be there and we will tell them what we know of Jesus. For tonight we pray it in His holy name, amen.